Um, unfortunately, some of you who know me know I find it very difficult to pronounce difficult names. Names are not that difficult. And so, Marco. Zhnilarich. Yeah. I can do it. <laughs> can you say it again? Yeah, Marko Zhnilarich. But, but don't bother. It's very, yeah. And N is not, it's pronounced, right? Zhnilarich, uh, yeah. N is pronounced, and this Z with a hat is Z, Z with a hat is Ch. Like, and it's no. university in Slovenia, I can't pronounce either. So, okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, so, welcome everyone. So, I will give uh, uh, two lectures on uh, transport. Uh, they will be, in a way, uh, very basic. So I will not go very deep into like research results. I will mention some uh, tomorrow. Uh, my aim is basically to tell you what are the tools, what are the objects that one discusses when studying transport so that everyone is sort of up to a level and then you can go and read papers, you know, so that, that you understand what are the quantities. And there are some uh, subtle points that I will also mention what, what what one has to be careful about and so on. So do stop me and ask questions at any point. Uh, so this is basically the plan. We will see how we go uh, with time. Uh, and uh, for the references, you, you, you will find more references in, in my notes that I have put online. Uh, but, uh, significant parts of those basic things you can uh, find in a review paper that we wrote a couple of years ago. So the reference is Bertini et al. And I will just put archive number. Zero three, zero three, three, three. Okay, so uh, why do we want to study transport? Uh, just very uh, broadly speaking, uh, it's part of the non equilibrium physics. So, equilibrium, on the other hand, we understand well, at least the, the techniques and the principles, basic principles are known, right? It might be difficult to evaluate. Uh, like partition function, for instance, but at least uh, we know the, the, the method. Non-equilibrium is, of course, by, by definition, everything that is not, non, that is not equilibrium. So it's a vastly uh, larger set of different questions and problems. And transport is perhaps one of the simplest ones that one can study. And uh, when you speak about transport, uh, we can speak about transport of conserved quantities. So that's important. Conserved quantities. What does it mean that uh, globally quantity has to be conserved? That means that um, you know, if I pick something, a box here, and I carry it to the other side of the room, then because the box doesn't disappear during my walking and doesn't appear out of nothing, it's conserved, I can speak about transport. So if some quantity is, can you know, appear out of nothing or disappear, then of course we cannot speak about transport. And just to give you a, a concrete example, a sort of canonical model to which I will occasionally return to illustrate things will be so-called X exists spin chain. So let me perhaps just write Hamiltonian here. So it's a one dimensional system of spin one half particles with nearest neighbor interaction with the following well known Hamiltonian. I'm sure that everyone knows it, but just let us write it down. Uh, so I'll write it in terms of Pauli spin matrices. Sometimes people write it in terms of spin operators, it's just a factor of one half between the two. So 
nearest neighbor xx interaction. Then we have sigma yy. And then to make it a little bit, I could write isotropic one, but to have a little richer physics, I will put here some parameter delta and isotropy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sigma z, sigma z. So this is called x, x, z, Heisenberg model. Um, and the naming is the following. So x, x, z, because in the x, x, y plane, the interaction strength is isotropic. So the same strength here. So whereas in the z direction, third one, there is this anisotropy parameter. So that's why it's called x, x, z. If I would write like uh, another version would be X, Y, Z. In this case, I would have three different prefactors in terms of X, X, Y, Y, and Z, Z. So in this case, Hamiltonian, let me put it here, perhaps X, X, Z, X, Y, Z would be, so I could put, I can put here, for instance, one minus gamma or two, sigma X, sigma X, one plus gamma over two, sigma y, sigma y, plus And so uh, going back to conserved quantities, what are, for instance, conserved quantities for X, X, Z model? Of course, having Hamiltonian system, so time independent Hamiltonian energy is always conserved. So for both models, we can speak about transport of energy. Uh, but this model has also U1 symmetry, rotation about Z axis, right? Because exactly these two uh, amplitudes are the same. So also total spin is conserved or magnetization if you want. So if I divide, uh, define capital Z as a sum of all sigma Z's, then Z, this Z is conserved for X, X, Z model. Meaning that the commutator with X, X, Z Hamiltonian is equal to zero. And so we can also discuss uh, spin or sometimes magnetization. That's the same thing. Transport. Whereas for X, Y, Z model, total spin is not conserved. And so one cannot speak about transport of magnetization because um, yeah, we don't have conservation. Yeah. For transport, isn't it also important that the sum over total space, you could imagine like a conjunction over the sum over total space? Uh, yeah, good point. Uh, so indeed, to speak about transport, how uh, a given quantity, magnetization, energy, and so on, is transported to some other place, it makes sense to have local uh, dynamics. So Hamiltonian, which is local. And so uh, just to, uh, later on, we will also ne uh, need energy density of our Hamiltonian. So we can write this Hamiltonian as sum over local H, K, K plus one, where this H, K, K plus one is the following. Yeah. No, the, uh, the conserved quantities usually want that, them to be a sum of local terms. So, that, uh, so for instance, if I would have like some, um, imagine I have a spin chain sides, right? If I would have some complicated operator, which would have support on L sides, then we could again question whether it makes sense to speak about transport or not. But like uh, usually we have uh, what you have in mind, local Hamiltonian and uh, 
conserved quantity, which is sum of local terms. Yes, it is. Sorry? Oh, yeah, okay, good question. So now to somehow join the two questions, right? Uh, oh, yeah, good. Uh, so um, the question was whether the quasi local uh, conserved quantities are also okay. And yes, they're okay. So basically, the question goes along the direction uh, because I guess I will mention at some point in integrable models, you have a whole series of conserved quantities, infinitely many. So those two that I wrote that I mentioned here, like spin, which is sum of um, uh, uh, density has support on one side, energy has support on two sides, and so on. We can continue this chain, getting more and more complicated conserved quantities. And then there is also something which is called quasi-local conserved quantity, which means that it's not strictly local, but it has some exponential tails. You could slightly transport of all those, but um, as far as I know, uh, not much has been done in this direction. To what, to what extent can we relax this conservation law? For example, I can have some local view types where I can consider the, to add some source contracts to the source view. Right. If there would be just some local violation at certain place, I guess one could still speak about, yeah. There can be only a few places. Right. I would, I mean, this is, of course, um, up to definition, right? What language you want to use, but yeah, I would tend to say, yeah, up to like a, a zero density of, of places where you have violation. Yeah, yes. Very good. Let me repeat question for uh, the sake of recording. Uh, I hope I remember each time. Uh, the question was whether we need like thermodynamic limit here, right? And uh, we will say more about that, but transport rigorously speaking, it's always defined only in the thermodynamic limit because only in thermodynamic limit of infinite times, you can distinguish between different functional forms. So, you know, power law with that or the other power. If you have finite system, then you are limited to finite windows of time. And then you cannot really distinguish, say, power law with one or the other power because it's just finite window, it's just some fitting. Okay, we saw, uh, we heard somewhere continuity equation, someone I think uh, mentioned, so let us, let us write down continuity equation because this will be what will define our current in terms of which we will then discuss transport. Uh, okay, let me perhaps just. So. So we have, if we have a conserved object, then continuity equation holds, right? Just to, for instance, is the uh, generic form, if we have some density rho, then continuity equation says that, like in differential form, right? Uh, says that time derivative of density plus divergence of current, this is current of appropriate conserved quantity, which density I'm writing here, is equal to zero. Uh, so in our discrete case, our context will be spin chains. So we will be on a lattice. Uh, spatial uh, coordinate is discrete index. So in this case, uh, to write it, for instance, for uh, magnetization, equation would be something like, uh, uh -huh. Okay, let me write it sigma z, say at side k. Time derivative of magnetization at certain side. Plus, now divergence will be just difference of currents on two neighboring sides. J, k minus j, k minus one should be zero. And such continuity equation will define what is the correct current for our conserved uh, quantity. 
for instance, for magnetization. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the question was, uh, is this quantum or classical? Just to simplify your question. And um, we will write it now down, uh, the, the Heisenberg evolution equation. So, so the way to understand this on the operator level is that this is like, uh, you know, sigma v at site k written in the Heisenberg picture is time dependent and then like in time derivative, you get this one. Yeah, just uh, actually next thing. I will write to do that. Like you can put this inside up. Uh, right. Uh, you can either consider this as on the level of operator or on the level of expectation values. But the, 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 the primary equation is on the level of operators. Uh, yeah. To write it larger. Yeah, OK. I will try, uh, remind me if I forget. Yeah. OK. Let me perhaps put it here because it's like also important equation. And instead of partial derivatives, I will just use the, the ordinary because it doesn't matter. So, sigma z, OK, t plus. So in this round bracket, this is divergence, discrete divergence equals zero. So is this size okay? Like, yeah, okay, I will try to keep it up. Yeah. Uh, I guess k minus k minus, or sorry, j k minus j k minus one versus j k plus one minus j. Right, right, it's uh, uh, up to definition, we will see, it yeah, yeah, doesn't matter. Okay, let us try, now uh, try to write it down. Now, let us try to figure out what is operator of spin current for X, Z, Heisenberg Hamiltonian. Um, yeah, let me just continue it here. So uh, Heisenberg equations of motion, right? So this is just the commutator with the Hamiltonian. So we have minus I commutator of the object whose time derivative we want to calculate with our H and let's take H X X Z. Now here, just to perhaps uh, have a sketch, I have like uh, this spin sigma z k. And then I will also plot two neighboring ones. So this is my site on which I want to know what is time derivative. And so because this guy is sum of local terms, right? I will just have two terms here. Commutator with this. Um, energy density h small h and with that and so i have like two terms minus i sigma zk h now this is site k minus one this is site k plus one so i have k minus one k so this is this bond plus sigma z k h k k plus one. So I have two terms. And those two terms can be actually identified with these two guys. So I can now comparing this expression with that one, I can say, uh-huh. J, K, an operator of spin current at site K, K is now, if you do the, the algebra, um, you get the following. So this is just the commutator between sigma Z, K 
K and Hamiltonian density on sites K and K plus one. And this is two times sigma X at site K, sigma Y at site K plus one minus the other way around. Sigma X K plus one. HK is just the, just the density. Right, HK is just the, HK is just this guy. So smaller H with appropriate indices. Global, total magnetization is conserved. Yes. Yeah. Oh, now, uh, right. If you look at this equation, if I sum over all the indices K, those guys will mutually cancel out. Plus, minus, plus, minus. So on this picture, right, we can now, uh, on the same period, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, otherwise you would not in the continuity equation at the boundary, you would not have one of them. So that's what I'm saying. It, it would correspond to uh, sigma z coming from the edge if it's, if the current, the change in sigma z can come from the uh, current at the edge of the thing. I mean, the, this equation holds regardless of periodic or open boundary conditions. So just continuity equation at the boundary would be more no, but if you integrate, if you integrate the, take the Diro dt divergence of J and integrate both sides over your sample. Yeah. You know, you get dq dt. Right, right, right. Boundary. To the integral of divergence of J, which is the Indeed. J at the bound, integrate over the bound. And that could be non-zero. That could be non-zero if you have ch chain coupled to something else. Right. If you don't have it, right, like say three sides, then this uh, boundary terms would be. Let me perhaps uh, first right. plot it here. That's just its current and the boundary is zero. Exactly, exactly. But it could be. Because the, just to uh, sketch here, right? Uh, two currents I have here are just this guy and that guy, these two terms, right? So you see, this is according to our. So this arrow here is J with index K. And that arrow is J with index K minus one. And coming back to the question from someone about the indices, I could as well call this one, you know, K and this one K plus one doesn't matter. Okay, so this is now our spin current operator. Uh, what about energy operator? I will leave this as an exercise. This is uh, in my notes. You have a couple of exercise, exercises. Exercise number one is actually energy current. by the same procedure. So energy current at the appropriate site will be commutated between energy density and what? So if I uh, show you with my fingers, right? Energy density whose current I want to calculate is at these two sites. And then I have to commute with the energy density on the neighboring sites. So they will like overlap and energy current will be three body operator. All right, so this is spin language. Uh, what co one could also in 1D, one could also use jordan Wigner transformation and go to fermionic picture, spinless fermions, right? So if you are not familiar with jordan Wigner, you can do this exercise two. I think it's, yeah, exercise two. 
Jordan, Wigner. And you can just uh, transform Hamiltonian to something which will have a nearest neighbor hopping term, kinetic term, and this delta sigma z sigma z will be transformed to density density nearest, nearest neighbor interaction. So this will be like interacting spinless fermions. This is the same, or in condensed matter, it's called TV model also. So maybe this, this current you can write as a sigma z as the charge times some sigma x, sigma x, and sigma y, sigma y. Right. But then you can it's, see that it's like actually some velocity times the charge just by writing sigma y. Uh, sigma x times sigma z, and the other sigma x is sigma y times sigma z. So you are now uh, thinking about fermionic pictures in no, this no, way? Just in, the, the J current you wrote down. Yeah. It's, it's hard to understand what it means. But oh. Maybe you, if you oh. replace sigma y by sigma x, sigma z. Oh, perhaps it would be, I could write it also in terms of sigma plus, sigma minus. <laughs> then it's perhaps easy to understand. So this is basically a hopping between nearest neighbor sites, which counts the number of, uh, uh, in fermionic language, actually this would particle current. And so this guy just counts the number of hops you make. So in fact, here, when I wrote spin magnetization, I could use, I could add another slash particle or charge transport. This is all the same thing, just different language, depending on the context. Yeah, okay, so this Jordan Wigner, you can try it out. Um, all right. So we mentioned uh, spin magnetization, or if you want uh, particle transport. Uh, before going on, let me let let me make a short comment uh, because uh, there is another quantity that one might want to study, and that is heat transport. Yeah. Heat versus energy. So, I mean, energy current. Let me perhaps. Write it here. Energy current at site K would be, as I said, a commutator like we had it here. I H K. Well, again, the indices doesn't matter really much, but to be consistent with my notes, K minus one K, comma H K. K plus one, this would be energy current. And energy current has microscopic definition, it's that. The same holds for spin current. It has microscopic definition, it's like that. But heat or heat current, if you want to discuss, discuss heat current, we always have to make an excursion into thermodynamics. There is no like heat operator whose excitation value is heat current. Because like, uh, just uh, remember uh, first law of thermodynamics, right? Uh, change of internal energy is dQ heat plus work. Right? This guy, internal energy is a function of a state, is a state function, whereas those guys are not. So sometimes one puts these bars here too stress that those are not a uh, complete differential of some function of a state. And so from here, you can see that I can, I can write immediately equation connecting heat, current and energy current. Because like uh, div dividing by time and area, I get a uh, uh, corresponding current, right? So and uh, <coughs> energy current is then equal to heat current 
uh, and now uh, work I can write uh, the differential of work I can write write mu dn and then dividing by t I will get um, particle current. So I have something like uh, plus mu jn particle current. And so from here, we see that heat current is equal energy current <clears throat> minus appropriate term involving, uh, yeah, minus J N. So heat current involves two, mic uh, two microscopically defined currents, energy current and particle current. This is just in fermionic language, this would be particle current. But then there is also this thermodynamic parameter chemical potential. <clears throat> I mean, I'm making this comment because often people, I mean, sometimes, not often, sometimes, uh, they just say, I mean, like that, and then call this heat current. This is not. Current. If you would identify this as the heat current, then you can come up with situations that violate the second law of thermodynamics. In one of the exercise, uh, 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 you can show in one of the exercises uh, how you can violate uh, second law of thermodynamics incorrectly identifying this heat current. Namely, you take uh, just very briefly what is the idea of the exercise. You take two reservoirs at the same temperature but different chemical potentials. And then if you have a on Zager matrix so that the you know, particle current is coupled with energy current, uh, you can have situation uh, where currents flow through your system, but the entropy production rate in the steady state is equal to zero. One of the versions of the second law of thermodynamics is that entropy production in the steady state where currents flow through your system should be non-zero. Anyway, you can have a look at that text and then you can discuss perhaps off, offline if you are. It's no particle conservation, so we'll think of as the conservation, so then you you would only have energy. Right, yes, yeah, indeed. indeed. If, if I write in the total linear basis, I will have only the particle. In, in which basis, say it again, please? Total, total linear basis. Oh, yeah. Then I will only have a particle. For like X, X, Z? For example, the EC. Uh, indeed, indeed, yeah, yeah. In in many models, uh, which are non-integrable, they don't have any extra symmetries. You have just energy conservation. Did you say particles? Yeah, I said when I write in the particles. Uh, so the particles. So the oh no, particles. energy. Sorry, no. Then you would have just energy conservation. You have pairing terms. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 Uh, say it again. Oh. Uh, indeed. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good point. Yes. So indeed, in a, in a Floquet setting, you can have situations where you just have particle. Uh, Transport, but no energy. Indeed, yeah, good point. Would make sense, yeah. Would not, yeah. Or you would have to, I mean, just not to get too deep into philosophical questions, or also on this level, you can sort of another way of interpreting that is that, um, you know, if you want to, I mean, this uh, first law of thermodynamics, what does it tell you? It tells you that somehow you split state function difference, internal energy in terms of two parts. Yeah. One part work is kind of a coherent macroscopic contribution to energy change. Heat on the other hand is like, if you want microscopic stochastic incoherent contribution. So, which means that in some, I don't know, weird setting where it's not clear what is one or the other, you could go along that path, trying to split your energy 
density or energy current into two parts. But again, just to, you know, to somehow you will not be able to avoid going into thermodynamics speaking about heat because it's just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, this is regardless of the thermodynamic limit. But of course, like the second law of thermodynamics and so on, hold only the thermodynamic limit. With... Sure, sure, sure. Everything is fine. Yeah. One should all only be careful that somehow you will have to read this new thermodynamic coefficient either measuring on the system or measuring uh, or, or reading it out of your bot or something like that, right? Because this new is, again, it's not expectation value or something of, of you know, like the temperature. It's thermodynamic parameters. That in one way or the other, you have to measure it, even like numerically. Uh, yeah, so what you can do is, uh, if your system thermalizes inside, I remember talked by David, I guess he was, mentioning that, right? Uh, then you can look at the reduced density operator of a small bunch of spins, compare it to the Gibbs, and then read out uh, mu, beta, or whatever other Lag Lagrange multiplier you might have. There might be other simpler ways, but this is like the you know, bulletproof approach. You just compare it to the Gibbs state. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can write currents, you can play with them, study transport, but uh, as far as I know, not much has been done. Yeah, so good, uh, perhaps, research project. Okay. Yes. Is this new, like in spin language, just magnetic field? Is even cool? Uh, indeed, yeah. Well, um, it's uh, not directly. So this is not a parameter in the Hamiltonian. This would be parameter in your equilibrium uh, density well, matrix, right? Question, you do the finite magnetization or fixed magnetization or fixed external field, right? Like if right. You, if you do it at fixed magnetization, then it's V, 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 M. This would be like uh, this mu in your equilibrium, right. say density operator. Of course, it's in a way it's uh, synonymous or very connected to the magnetic field, right? Because well, it's. That? Yeah, that's just I could, Z. H as Z. Right, right, in the spin language, actually, it would be like that. Yes, Z. Okay. Yeah, so this uh, uh, just uh, this is exercise. Uh, let me see. Number three, you can have a look. And we can discuss offline more if you are interested in this. Um, Good, so this was like a introduction, yeah? point one, so that we know what are the objects that we will discuss, uh, conserved densities, uh, currents, and now uh, let us see how can we get a handle on transport. So this theory and method is sort of a, it could be also one topic, but uh, probably we will not be able to do two and three today, so I'll split it, I, I have split it into So theory. Uh, basically, I will mention three approaches how one can quantify transport. Uh, one will be linear response, A linear response, B will be like a driven setting. So you really take some reservoirs, couple your system to reservoirs, and then you obtain a steady state, and then you can play. I mean, play. You can ask questions about transport. So uh, let me say non equilibrium setting. And then 
C. I will not say much about C. EC, you could also, or let me add here, non equilibrium steady state. Steady state setting. This steady state is supposed to imply that I have some reservoirs. So I can get some state which is independent of time, end of the day. Whereas here, I can also do unit evolution of some inhomogeneous initial state. Unitary evolution of inhomogeneous state. This would be sometimes called a quench. I just start with some bump, say Gaussian packet, you let it evolve. And then you might look at how the width of the packet goes with time. And this might uh, uh, tell you what transport type you have, what is diffusion constant and so on. Let us just start with A. So linear response. Uh, I guess everyone has heard some linear response in one of the StatMec courses or something like that, uh, but let me just motivate with one very simple example, which will get us to the, you know, the, the basic idea of linear response and of green Kubo formulas, uh, which will express appropriate transport coefficient in terms of current current autocorrelation function. So this simple example is like a, a, let me write example. It's really just a classical uh, um, cartoonish illustration. Uh, so let us have a particle that somehow moves stochastically or not, doesn't matter. We ha and we can write the co coordinate of this particle simply as an integral of its velocity. And uh, in the spirit of, so somehow we are looking at this uh, in this way. So we will now have a look at how the variance of this particle grows with time. So let us have a look at x of t squared and average. Now this average means, so suppose this is some stoha either stochastic uh, trajectory or I have different realization of this velocity and then I, I have some ensemble averaging. So this is what this averaging is supposed to mean. And writing this out, yeah, it's uh, very simple. Or let me put it like that. I have two integrals. dt1, dt2 of vt1, vt2, right? I just wrote out the square, nothing special. Uh, now let's assume that this, this is just a velocity correlation function, right? Let's assume now that this velocity correlation function is stationary in time meaning that it depends only on the difference of indices. Stationary in time. Now this might not hold exactly for very short times, very small uh, time differences, but for large differences, often this will hold. So we're just assuming that this holds. Then I can write this double integral, you know, just to, sketch you how we are now integrating of this over these two variables. We are integrating of the square, right? From zero to T. And then if this guy is just a function of the difference of times, those fixed values of the difference between T1 and T2 are just uh, these lines, right? So here, the difference T2 minus T1 is zero on this line and so on. So I can write this under this assumption of stationarity, I can write this integral as 
single integral of v zero v tau v tau p minus tau. Well, I'm making a mess. Sorry for that. <laughs> So just let me explain. Uh, this t minus tau is just the length of those lines, right? And I have twice two because I have this upper one, upper triangle, lower triangle. So there is two times. So there is one factor of two here. And I integrate from uh, zero to t. You agree? So I just use stationarity in time, meaning that uh, uh, I can shift all the indices. So I write here this tau, if you want, is just t2 minus t1. And now the integral of over tau is basically integral over this direction. Right. And uh, how will this behave, this integral behave for long times? So let us assume on top of it, this is now correlation function, autocorrelation function of velocity. Let us assume that this guy goes to zero for sufficiently long times. So V of tau goes to zero, four times larger than some correlation time, right? Then for very large times, the dominant term from this integral will come from T times this correlation function, right? Because this second term tau times this guy will contribute only for times smaller than the correlation time, right? Because otherwise this guy is zero. And so asymptotically for say very large times, I will just write T much larger than one, meaning one means actually correlation time. This will behave as two, t and then this integral of uh, autocorrelation which I will simply denote by capital capital T and I denote it by capital T capital T integral from zero to I can extend this to infinity of this autocorrelation function now. Right, so uh, perhaps I was a bit uh, fast here. Let me explain. So again, for times much larger than the correlation time, I can neglect this tau times this guy yeah, because tau is fixed. And whereas t grows, it's very large. Yeah? And then it, uh, I can pull t out of the integral. And then on, on top of it, if t is much larger than this correlation time, this integral from zero to some very large t, will be effectively the same as integral from zero to infinity because this guy anyway is zero for, you know, uh, at very large times. And so we just got a very nice equation that this variance, I will now denote this as sigma square simply. This is the variance of our uh, trajectory asymptotically for very long times goes as two times time d, and this d is called diffusion constant. So this is just diffusion constant. Diffusion. And in this very simple example, we obtain uh, this expression where we expressed some coefficient, transport coefficient, diffusion constant in that case, as integral of a correlation function of which object? Well, of velocity. And velocity is nothing but derivative of position. So we could say that this velocity is actually 
current of position, if you want, in very odd language. And this will be the same situation in all linear response formulas for transport coefficients. You will see transport coefficient is expressed as an integral of appropriate uh, current correlation function, current corresponding to the conserved quantity that we are looking at. Okay, any question about, yeah. Oh, yeah, very good. So the question was, uh, aren't linear response supposed to hold only for small perturbations? Indeed, very good point. So this derivation is exact. So it's actually beyond linear response. Whereas in linear response, I will, which I will now go into, yeah, it will hold only for sufficiently small perturbations. Here, everything was so simple that we could exactly get this, yeah. Quantify fluctuations, it doesn't, it doesn't, you haven't yet shown that this has to do with anything to do with the response. Yes, indeed, indeed. Actually, at some point, uh, uh, I don't know whether today or perhaps tomorrow, we will have to connect diffu diffusion constant with uh, conductivity, which will come out of linear response. And there will be some, you know, there will be some comments needed to connect the two. Oh, this one. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, asymptotic sign. This is like, uh, uh, I was, uh, I've been told that like in US or like uh, this is French, German, perhaps, or European thing, I don't know. But like the, you know, too curly, it's asymptotic sign. In tech, asymp. It just means like for uh, sufficiently long times. Yeah. All right, now let us uh, perhaps go back to a real serious linear response. Now I'm not sure how much linear response I need to repeat, but let me perhaps just uh, write one or two equations and then you can ask question or, or not. I mean, ni nice book for this linear response business is uh, Potier. And of course, there are many other textbooks. Noel Potier, uh, tightly something like non equilibrium statistical physics. And it's really standard textbook stuff. So so in linear response, we start with Hamiltonian, which is equal to H naught plus some small perturbation. And this, uh, there's usually for aesthetic reasons, we put some minus sign here, some small uh, time dependent object, which would be in our, our case, I will comment later on, this would be like an electric field. For instance, if we would study charge transport times some operator, which is coupled to degrees of freedom in our Hamiltonian. And then what we want to understand in linear response is how some other operator B responds to this small perturbation. This guy is small, supposed to be small. So this A, imagine it as some small parameter. And so just to, so what one gets is something like that. Integral between response function B A T minus tau, A of tau, D tau. Just the convolution between the response function and uh, our field. And this response function is the following thing. So we have some heavy side theta function for causality. There is beta, and I will write it in a bit odd way and I will explain it immediately. So beta divided by beta, integral from zero to beta of a dot minus i h lambda b t equilibrium d lambda. And this whole thing, including one over beta is called Kubo correlation function.
And the expectation value here, okay, let me write it. This expectation value of some object equilibrium is just trace of that same operator multiplied with uh, some say canonical Gibbs state e to minus beta h zero. Uh, here, uh, beta inverse temperature. Yeah, sorry, yes, yes. So beta is one over k Boltzmann t. So uh, one can write this linear response also in other ways. For instance, you might be more familiar with like a commutator correlation function here. I deliberately use this Kubo version because it will come handy in our case for the, uh, because we, this dot is here a derivative, like Heisenberg picture and then time derivative. And you will see why we will need this one. So is everyone more or less okay with that? Yeah, good. Minus I H bar, not the light factor. Oh, here. <coughs> uh, so, so what is the question? So, I mean, you integrate over this D lambda, and I'm writing this H bar explicitly because uh, in the rest of the talk, I'm putting H bar to zero, but I'm keeping it here because I will make some comments about classical. Uh, this is, oh, what is the, the A or B of T? Oh, okay, this is the Heisenberg picture. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, yes. So uh, both these two guys are propagated with the unperturbed H0 Hamiltonian. So it's like the, or interaction picture would be called in this, this situation actually. And this is in imaginary time, yeah. Uh, let me perhaps write now uh, this equation for the specific case of, for instance, charge or spin transport, so that I will rewrite it in our language of, you know, currents and so on. And then we can make further comments. Un unless there is some question about notation at this point. Yeah. Okay, so let me let, let us then uh, write this down for um, example of current transport. Or charge transport. So in this case, we would have, okay, H zero, and let us just take some uh, single particle. So forget about now our spin chains to make things simpler. Let us just have single particle in electric field, single charge particle in, in electric field. Then this would be like E charge, our electric field, homogeneous, especially uh, times X. Right, so this E times X is just potential. And this is charge times potential energy, right? And so in this language of linear response, what do we have? E of T is like small a here, right? And this operator capital A is small X. So let me write it here as a sort of a dictionary. So A, is like X and A of T is like a E electric field. And so now let us look <clears throat> what do we need in this uh, linear response equation. We will have uh, A dot here, right? Because we are using this Kubo version and A dot is just velocity. And charge times velocity is just current. B, okay, so what do we want to uh, calculate? We want to calculate response of current to such perturbation, right? 
So for B, we will take current, small j. And then this linear response has very nice form. It will tell us, okay, how current changes according to this formula. And this correlation function, we will have current current correlation function. That's why I'm picking this Kubo version and not the committed or, or any other. And so just to write the final equation, Oh, yeah, and, and uh, defining equation of conductivity would be what? How is conductivity defined in like condensed matter? It's defined as a coefficient between current and electric field. And we can write this in the frequency space yeah, because we are allowing for generic time dependent uh, electric field. So writing this equation in Fourier space, right? We would have something like that. J of <clears throat> omega frequency would be conductivity, frequency dependent conductivity times E of omega. This would be, this is like a definition of sigma of omega conductivity. Definition of So this is nothing with linear response, it's just definition, how we define. And now uh, looking at our linear, linear response, right? This convolution I can write in, for, in Fourier space, it will be ju just a product of Fourier transformation. Transformations, so we can see that sigma of omega is just Fourier transformation of our response function. And so to write it down with all the uh, factors and everything, we get something like, uh, why, what do we good have, yeah. Okay, there is one integral of from Fourier transformation. E i omega t dt. And then there is this integral over uh, beta, like the inverse temperature here. So zero to beta j minus i h lambda j of t. Equilibrium d lambda. So we expressed conductivity in terms of our current correlation function. And now I guess I can write the same expression for our specific lattice model, for instance, Heisenberg model or something like that, uh, where if you now look back, uh, so we have current that is defined at certain lattice site, right? So we now uh, we will write this conductivity in terms of uh, this uh, correlation function of this current. And so let me just uh, write it down and then we can... Uh, Here, uh, beta times one over beta, which is one, right? But I'm writing it like that because actually this guy, including one over beta, but without the first beta is Kubo correlation function. And it's defined with one over beta because for instance, in the limit of small beta, this integral is proportional to beta and then it cancels this one. And I will actually comment on this unfortunate bit a bit later, uh, because in all, uh, perhaps let me write the equation down and then I will comment this beta, yeah, because it's kind of uh, ugly to have this beta. These betas pop up in conductivity everywhere. Yeah, exactly. So the short answer to your immediate question is that actually well-defined quantity is actually sigma divided by beta, and this will be like uh, up to some pre-factor will be diffusion constant. So this beta here is basically there because of this unfortunate definition from thermodynamic point of view, because driving force is actually not E, but E divided by T, right? If you remember ther thermodynamics, irreversible thermodynamics, these generalized forces are object which 
stand in the expansion of a differential of entropy, right? Like me over T, beta, and so on. And because we left out this beta here, this beta then pops out it in the expression for sigma. It's a bit ugly, but okay, this is the how people define so. Yeah. Yes. The way I understand is the linear response theory is uh, valid for small groups. Yeah. Is there a sense in which the conductivity has bounded error in frequency domain? Can we take that small parameter and show what is the correction for conductivity? Yeah, so to repeat the question, uh, the question is basically uh, validity of linear response. Yeah. The, <laughs> can we say something? And in general, this is very a very hard question. Yeah, so I don't think that in general one can say much about. Uh, of course, one could in the derivation here one can calculate the next order and then uh, discuss. But then what could happen, at, and often it happens in many body systems that also like, uh, you know, the convergence radius could go zero or something like that. So actually, validity of this linear response uh, is is rather subtle issue. Yeah, so. I don't think I can say much more. Okay, let me write now this equation now for the case of spin transport and then we will be in business. So let me uh, define global or cumulative current if you want. This will be sum over K of all local currents. So you can have in, in your mind this uh, spin transport that uh, we sketch there. Then we have the following expression for sigma of omega. There is this beta yeah, that we just discussed. And here now I will write explicitly limits because I will make several comments. So limit, outer limit is time to infinity then limit system size to infinity. L is number of lattice size. Uh, then, okay, this one over beta, and then just the kubo. Beta D lambda, then there is this Fourier transformation. I omega T, and then one over L of J, zero j and here actually because this correlation function here is equilibrium correlation function in equilibrium correlation functions are then stationary in time so i can shift move this argument to this one to have a slightly nicer expression this i will do here so first argument is zero and second argument will be, then be t plus this guy t plus i h bar lambda closing bracket, equilibrium, and dt. So this is now our expression, for instance, for <coughs> spin transport, yes. Uh, uh, yes, yes. Let me just, sorry. Oh yeah, okay, okay, I, no, yeah. Okay, I explicitly wrote finitely because now I will comment and then perhaps it's a little bit ugly if you, I mean, physicists we don't mind, but let me just perhaps just write tau so that there is, you know, we all the time use this uh, T everywhere. The, yeah, so, uh, okay, let me now first make comments and then uh, uh, questions. Indeed, first these limits, why am I stressing? So correct thermodynamic limit is always first system size to infinity then time to infinity, not the other way around. So if you have a finite system and first take time to infinity, you might get incorrect results. And I will comment at some later point, uh, one specific example where things can go wrong. Because in a way you can uh, imagine like that. If you have a finite system, you know, 10 sides, and then take time to infinity first. Then eventually for very long times, time say longer than the inverse level spacing. This is called Heisberg time. 
everything will be sort of periodic or quasi periodic. So in a way, even if you have chaotic system, system will behave as if it would be integrable. So that's why the, the order of limits is here important. Uh, <clears throat> this equilibrium expectation value is at whatever temperature you have, finite, infinite. Yeah? But then there is also this uh, nasty integral over betas here and this imaginary Heisenberg evolution. So if you want to deal with finite temperatures, you just have to calculate this uh, a bit not very nice looking uh, autocorrelation function. There are special limits where this simplifies, right? For instance, if H bar goes to zero, then I can neglect this, this thing and I will get just classical correlation function like the one uh, we saw there yeah? with no imaginary time here. Or another limit where this is just, uh, uh, we can drop this term is in the infinite temperature limit. So if beta goes to, so T to infinity means beta going to zero, right? So then there is nothing to integrate here. I can just put lambda to zero. Again, I don't have this term. And then this beta cancels that beta yeah, because this integral is proportional to beta so that everything is canceled. That's the classical limit. Yeah, so let me perhaps write it. And I'll write classical in quotation mark. Uh, so this is either h bar to zero or beta to zero. And in this case, one just has this simple, like this would be called like a classical correlation function, not this nasty Kubo one. Uh, one can actually express this Kubo correlation function in various other ways. I will not bore you with those expressions. Uh, one you can find in notes and perhaps one or two more in the review there. For instance, you can, instead of this uh, Kubo correlation function, you can take with some extra prefactors, you can also take a real part of the classical correlation function and so on. So there are different expressions. So if you read papers, you know, in you might find this one, you might find some other one or some third one. Yeah. So, sorry, this would be the obvious question, but in terms of the example you've given, uh, you could express this as a classical and this is a dialectic. Yeah. In terms of which function? A dialectic. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is written for uh, like with uh, having in mind like spin transport, but similar expressions are for other quantities. For instance, for energy transport, it would be very similar. The only thing that one has to pay attention is how is appropriate, you know, conductivity defined, because there might be some, like for energy transport, we might have beta in the definition of, uh, uh, you know, our definition of transport coefficient, but that's just a, like minor point. Yes. The lambda integral originally emerged because we combined beta h with the Heisenberg with the yeah. Uh, so, like here, right? So, like one version of this guy that might be more familiar would be like a, a expectation value of a commutator, something like that, instead of this Kubo, right? And then one, what one? I mean, and thermodynamic average, exactly. And now this, we could also use this version, but it would not be as nice because we would have here like current and then like a sort of position, not really current. And so the way you get this Kubo is that you, because here in the equilibrium expectation value, you have this E to minus beta H, and then you just use a cyclicity of the trace to move this E to minus beta H into uh, Heisenberg evolution. Yeah. And the commutator basically gives you this dot time uh, derivative. Yeah. Well, this was like a, a sort of a hand-waving argument. Yes, indeed. 
So in a, I mean, in a finite dimensional Hilbert space, right? You have finite many energy levels. So you can write anything time dependent operator as sum over some oscillating parts. And so after a sufficiently long time, you might get recurrences or whatever. So even if for short times, I don't know, correlation function might look like it decays, at long times, strange things might happen. And you want to avoid that. So in a way, I mean, later on, I will probably brought some pictures of how correlation function looks like. And you should always uh, do for scaling, right? Increase system size, and then watch up to which times the behavior is already like thermodynamic one, because for sufficiently long times, this uh, quasi periodicity of discrete spectrum will kick in and uh, spoil correct thermodynamic behavior. I don't know whether it fully answers, but. Uh, Uh, all right, so we have like 10 minutes. Let's perhaps um, let us have a look at one very simple example. So, uh, uh, and so that we will have some feeling how the sigma of, of omega conductivity looks like. And this simple example will be called is called the Druda model, which you might be familiar. You find it in Ashcroft Mermin, any textbook. But let us now uh, discuss it discuss it in the context of this uh, green cubo like formula. So, yeah, let me perhaps just say behavior of sigma of omega. So the sigma of omega conductivity is some complex function. It has a real and imaginary part because of you know, this Fourier transformation. Uh, and uh, drew the model. Now drew the model microscopically is just a model of particle that is accelerated but co by constant electric field. And then uh, there is also some uh, resistive force proportional to the velocity. So there is also dissipation. And uh, here I will not go start from this microscopic picture. I will just say that let us assume that correlation function, and for the sake of simplicity, let us discuss just this classical correlation function. Let us assume that this correlation function decays exponentially. This is the nicest correlation function that you can have. So this, let me know this C of T, like defined. So this is current autocorrelation function. And let's write this as some uh, amplitude C0 times E to minus um, T divided by tau. Oh, and uh, I will also put this one over L here. So like here. So the, this uh, uh, object, including one over L has a well-defined thermodynamic limit uh, because we are taking this expensive guy here. <clears throat> now, this is just a matter of doing simple for transformation. So everyone can do this. I will just write down the result. And the result is the following. D zero tau one minus I omega tau times beta. So this is the result doing this Fourier transformation. So we see it's uh it's a yeah. Oh uh Ah, yeah, okay, thank you. T, yes, yeah. This tau incidentally is just the relaxation time in the Druda model. If you're familiar with the Druda model, this is the same tau. So we have real part. This is traditionally denoted by sigma prime of omega plus imaginary part, sigma two prime of omega. 
And let, let us just sketch these two guys so that we have some feeling how those objects look like. First real part of conductivity. If you tell the real part, this is just Lorentzian. Yeah, so nothing too special. So this is frequency zero. And uh, well, I can write the full expression. So C zero tau divided by one plus omega square tau square times beta. Imaginary part. We could get imaginary part also using Kramer's chronic relation, yeah. But here we can just take imaginary part on that, of that one, and it's something like a, it's a, with respect to zero, it's odd function. So at zero, it's zero actually, and uh, so anti-symmetric, something like that. So full expression, it's c zero omega tau divided by one plus. Omega tau, or omega square tau square times beta. Here, in either way, we can go with Kramer's chronic relation. If we want to. Okay, so uh, we will discuss tomorrow how we can now connect conductivity with diffusion constant, but this Lorentzian peak is sometimes called diffusive Lorentzian peak. We will see the diffusion constant is actually connected with the value at omega zero here up to some three factors. We will write this down tomorrow. Uh, another thing we can see, and this is perhaps the final a uh, uh, piece I will mention today is let us try letting this tau correlation func correlation time of our uh, current correlation function to infinity. So what does that mean physically? It means that basically correlation function doesn't decay at all, right? So we, we are making it flatter and flatter. So it's kind of a, uh, it has value C, C zero. Uh, and let's look at the real part. Basically real part of conductivity is the thing that we want to understand. How does it behave? Well, this Lorentzian peak becomes thinner, thinner and higher. And if you remember, well, uh, one of the ways you can write delta function, Dirac delta function is just the Lorentzian. So up to three factors, this becomes a delta function. Sigma prime of omega goes into delta function. And this will be a signal of ballistic transport. So of transport where there is no dissipation. We will comment more on that tomorrow because why? Well, if current autocorrelation function doesn't decay, this means that there is really no dissipation in a way that correlation function would go to zero. And so this means ballistic transport. And just to, to get the pre-factors uh, correctly, actually, let me write it perhaps equality sign in this limit um, and uh, let me divide it like that. So two pi script D. So just defined now in this limit, this has this form and this script D turns out to be C zero over two times beta. And this script D is called through the weight.
drew the weight and is a signal of ballistic transport. Uh, we will discuss this more in detail. What does it mean that ballistic transport? And we will again uh, go through that uh, tomorrow. Uh, you can check uh, here. I just wrote the result, but one of the exercises is actually to, to derive that using. Uh, no, there are different ways. Uh, this is exercise. Uh, which one? Yeah. So I will stop here now. If there are questions, so we can discuss more. Exercise. Exercise. So exercise four. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it turns out that it's because it's like a, a it's a fluctuation, right? Because it's JJ, so it's like a fluctuation, like J square. But this fluctuation will scale as L, not L square. This is quick way, but we can go also. I mean, you know, perhaps afterwards I can show you on the blackboard how you can really write down the Hamiltonian with appropriate perturbation, like we did it here, right? Here, and then you actually uh, will get this L automatically without any mambo jumbo arguments. You can also think it like that, yes. Because here you will have all like JK, JL, right? But uh, you will have contribution only at finite distance, and therefore it will be like proportional to L, indeed, yes. Good that you are, because it's confusing, yes. Yeah. So uh, here. This is the confusing definition, right? Because this is what, let me write it another way. So J of omega is sigma times, and this is the gradient of uh, potential. But in thermodynamics, uh, starting from thermodynamics, we would actually prefer to put driving force not as a gradient of potential, but gradient of potential divided by T. Because if you write ds, differential of entropy, right, then you have like, a, say, uh, let's discuss this, uh, this guy here. Perhaps we were discussing thermodynamics here, right? So ds would be mu, like the one term. I mean, you have many terms, and then you have, uh, sorry, it's mu t dn. And so, you always have a product of extensive quantity, like N energy and so on, times some int intensive uh, thermodynamic factors. And to have nice equations without extra prefactors, what you have to do is take these gradients of those guys as your driving forces. And then you don't have any betas. So actually here I, I made a mistake. One should use gradient of phi divided by T everything and then there would be no beta here yeah this would be sort of natural unit so basically here we would have to put one additional t and then yeah. In, indeed yes so for instance, if, if one would ask question, what is sigma of omega at zero temperature? The answer is zero, yeah? But then the, the correct object to look at is sigma divided by beta, which is finite, also at zero, also at zero at in, and as well as at infinite temperature. So well-defined object at all temperatures is sigma divided by beta, which we will see tomorrow, it's just the diffusion constant. Uh, 
say, take this definition, right? So this is the linear response equation. Yeah. So this beta is here, exactly. So if I would divide, then beta scans, and this will be like diffusion constant where we see tomorrow. And this is well-defined and finite at all temperatures. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So basically this is Kubo, which is well-defined and finite, finite at every beta. And this beta came for the reason that I explained here, because we didn't put beta in the definition of sigma, because we ignored thermodynamics. So don't worry for now, for betas, uh, we, we can return to, the, we will return to them tomorrow, but uh, yeah, it just, uh, perhaps just keep in mind that this is the, the, core, the object with well-defined limits at uh, infinite and uh, small temperatures. Uh, yeah, I could, I could, uh, for instance, do like this and uh, cancel that one. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, in practice, for instance, uh, you can also write the whole thing in terms of small j, small j here, right? But usually, this big j, big j correlation function is, uh, has better statistical properties in terms of convergence with system size because sort of you have you get a little bit of uh, not self averaging, but you know. Yeah. Well, I guess lunch. <laughs>